Well, boy, we sing all kinds of different genre of music here at HCC, right? I appreciate it. I don't know whether you notice how well uh, Tim Elton is doing. If you've been a part of HCC for a while, you know the, the physical struggles that he has gone through, and it's just a blessing to see how, how God is healing him, and he's physically strong, and he's able to stand up and, and use his uh, gift and his ability to serve the Lord. So thank you, Tim. We appreciate that so very much. And aren't you glad? Yeah, let's, let's uh, give the Lord a praise for that. And aren't you glad that, that God's love for us extends beyond our failures? And his love for us is a love that never, ever, ever ends. And uh, I've been the recipient of that and I trust that you've been the recipient of that as well. If you have your, your Bible, your iPhone, your iPad, uh, I guess a Samsung phone as well. I don't want to be specific. Um, I, I don't want to aggravate our, our uh, Samsung people. So uh, turn with me to Genesis chapter 45. Genesis chapter 45, we're in the midst of a series called Fight for Your Family. And obviously that song was appropriate because... We're talking about families and the importance of fighting for them. Today, I want to kind of delve into a subject that might be a little tender for some of us here today, but I believe it will be very, very relevant. And so I want to be, I want to be loving and I want to tread lightly and kindly and compassionately. And yet, I believe that today's message will speak to many of us. And I want to talk about the importance of healing broken family relationships. I would remind you that our theme is fight for your family, not fight with your family. And uh, sometimes our fighting for our family transitions into fighting with our family. I would say that there's very few things that are more emotionally painful than a broken family relationship. I know as I speak to a crowd the size that, that there's people here today that are estranged from certain members of your family. It might be a, a son or a daughter, it might be a parent, it might be a brother or a sister, it might be a spouse. And today you're experiencing pain because there is a family relationship in your life that is broken. And you might not know what to do about that. I would, I would submit to you today that it happens even to the best of families. If you're in the midst of a broken relationship, it doesn't mean that you come from a bad family. It doesn't mean that you or your family member is a bad person. It happens to the best of families. Every family has disagreements. Every family has conflicts. Every family has fights. I can't even stand up before you today and say that Vicki and I never argue. We never get in a fight because that simply wouldn't be true. I can tell you that I never win. She always wins the fights when that happens. So the question for us today is this. How do we respond to a conflict? How do we respond in our families to a disagreement? How do we respond if that family relationship is broken? For, for example, how do you handle a difficult relative? It seems like almost every family has one member of their family who's obnoxious and cantankerous and hard to get along with. You might have a grumpy grandmother in your family like Medea, or you might have a... Uh, uh, you might have a mooching cousin like Cousin Eddie from uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. How do you deal with a family member like that? How do you react when a family member deeply offends you? It's probably happened to most of us, if not all of us, that a family member has, has deeply hurt us, has deeply offended us. How do you restore a relationship with a sibling, with a parent, with an in-law, with whom you have stopped speaking? You haven't had any contact with that family member from some, for some period of time, and you're not even sure whether you want to. You're not sure how to proceed. Those are great questions. I believe they're relevant questions for us. Well, here's one thing I'm grateful for today is that the Bible has answers 
to all of those questions. The Bible addresses each of those challenging issues. There are several stories in God's Word that we could look to as an example, but I want us to spend time in the latter part of the book of Genesis, and I want us to see specifically the story of Jacob and his sons, Jacob and his family, and see the conflict that they experienced and see how eventually that family conflict was resolved. Let me just put it all in context and we'll get to our text in just a few moments. But the latter part of Genesis relates for us the story, the history as it were, of Jacob's family. Let me just remind you, I know I'm probably uh, speaking to seasoned Bible students here. Maybe I'm not. Maybe you've never read the book of Genesis. And so let me just give you like a family timeline in the book of Genesis. So you may remember in Genesis chapter 12 that God called Abraham out from a land, Ur of the Chaldees, and God promised Abraham that he would make from his family a great nation. And Abraham didn't have a child till later in his life, and finally Isaac, the son of his old age, was born. Well, Isaac grows up, and Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau, and by the way, there's another family conflict. You can see how they dealt with that family conflict. And then the Bible kind of traces the story of that family through Jacob and his family. And Jacob had 12 sons, who later became the founders, as it were, the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel. Here's one of the things I love about Scripture. I love the transparency of the Bible. I love how the Bible doesn't minimize sin or, or sugarcoat failure. Even the Bible's main characters are not portrayed as perfect heroines or perfect heroes of the story. And we see that with the story of Jacob, and we'll see it in Genesis 45 here in just a few moments. But the Bible honestly depicts Jacob's family as flawed, and I would even use the word dysfunctional. <laughs> As you study Jacob's family and the relationship, and we'll see in just a few moments, but that relationship, their relationship was dysfunctional. As a matter of fact, if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 37, let me just read one verse out of Genesis chapter 37 and verse 3. It says this, Now Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. Do you see any dysfunction there? <laughs> so all of a sudden Jacob had 12 sons, but he what? He, he expresses favoritism to one of those sons. Joseph was Joseph and Benjamin were the sons of his old age, and Jacob didn't mince any words. He demonstrated his favoritism for Joseph to the other sons, and, and that favoritism caused bitterness, it caused resentment, and it caused family division. And quite frankly, it was Jacob's favoritism of Joseph that caused the brothers' cruel actions toward their younger brother. If you don't know the story, let me just tell it to you in about 30 seconds. So uh, Joseph's brothers were out in the field tending sheep, and Jacob sends Joseph to find out how his brothers were. And the brothers see Joseph coming from a distance, and they conspire among themselves, and they said, okay, it's time that we get rid of this dreamer. <laughs> This, this brother who has aggravated us, who has been our father's constant favorite, it's time we get rid of him. And the brothers conspired. They threw Joseph in a pit. That's just where they started. And not long after that, this band of Midianites, Ishmaelites, is coming along. And the one brother says to the others, hey, let's make some profit off of our younger brother. And they sell Joseph into slavery. Now, now let me pause for a second and say, you might have family problems, but I guarantee you, you've never experienced what Jacob's family experienced. Where, where, where certain siblings hating another sibling so much that they literally sold him or her to be a slave. That's what takes place in the book of Genesis. So Joseph is transported to the land of Egypt far away from his home. In Genesis chapter 39, he's purchased by a man named Potiphar, who was an Egyptian ruler. And for a period of time, Joseph serves in Potiphar's house. 
Joseph is falsely accused at some point by Potiphar's wife. And he is then sent to prison. And Joseph innocently spends years in prison, far away from home, for a crime that he never committed, and ultimately for a bad relationship with brothers who never loved him and never cared for him. As we read through the story of Joseph, though, it's amazing that although rejected by his family and sold into slavery, the Lord is still with Joseph. If you haven't read that story, let me encourage you to go home and read it this afternoon. Because God was with Joseph in spite of all the bad things that happened to him. As a matter of fact, five times in Genesis chapter 39, it makes this statement, the Lord was with Joseph. When he was a slave in Potiphar's house, the Lord was with him. When he was treated unjustly, the Lord was with him. When he was falsely accused, the Lord was with him. And as he spent years in an Egyptian prison, the Lord was with him. If you know much about the story of Joseph, his trials lasted for 13 years. So for 13 years, he either served as a slave in an Egyptian household or he sat in an Egyptian prison until miraculously one day God exalts him from the Egyptian prison to second in command over the entire country of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. You might sit back and say, oh my word, Brian, how in the world did that happen? Read the story in the book of Genesis. God then sends a famine and uses Joseph. That's all part of it. But God sends a famine after seven years of plenty. God sends a famine not only to the country of Egypt, but he sends a famine to all of the world. And God in his sovereignty uses that famine to reconcile Joseph's fragmented family. And so that's where we are in Genesis chapter 45. And so if you have your Bibles open there in Genesis 45 or your your phone or your iPad or whatever you have, we're going to put it up on the screen. Follow along because because, uh, the text tells us that they were in the middle of the famine. As a matter of fact, in Genesis 41, 54, it says that the seven years of famine had begun in the land. And the famine was all throughout the land except in the country of Egypt. As we begin Genesis 45, the famine is in its second year with five more years to go. Joseph's family, Jacob and the sons, are back in Canaan. They are being affected by the famine as well. They've already gone to Egypt once for food, and now his brothers go back to Egypt for food just to survive, and they find themselves in the presence of their brother, even though they didn't know it. So Genesis chapter 45 and verse 1, here's Joseph who is now second in command over all of Egypt and the brothers who had sold him into slavery, the brothers who had dropped him into a pit, the brothers who hated him stand in front of him. And here's Joseph's response. Genesis 45 and verse 1. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the house of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Try your best to put yourself in this situation. Here are these brothers who had sold their younger brother into slavery. They hated him, and they thought when they sent him off with those Midianites that he was either dead or done for, and they would never see him again. And here they are standing in front of the second most powerful man in the world, and it's none other than the brother whom they had sold into slavery. And Joseph looks at them, and he says... I'm Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. (laughs) You think? (laughs) They were dismayed at his presence. Man, what a powerful illustration for us. 
So, so today, I, I want to be as biblical as I possibly can, but I want to be as practical as I possibly can, because I want to meet you and your family relationship where you are, and you might be here today and say, Brian, thankfully, I am not in the middle of a broken relationship, and that's great, but you might be someday. Or you might find yourself in a situation where you do not know how to respond in a difficult situation. I want to pull some truths from Joseph's response here that will apply to our lives wherever we are in our relationship. So the first thing that I wrote in my notes is this. If you have your outline in front of you, it's this. Be the first one to initiate a reconciliation. So you have a broken family relationship. You haven't spoken to someone for a period of time. The situation, the relationship is rough. You as a follower of Jesus Christ, be the first one to initiate a reconciliation. You see in the text here, and we just read it, Joseph could not control his emotions. Joseph was moved to tears. Verse 2 says that he wept aloud. He then inquires about his father and he inquires about the rest of the family. Here's the sub point I put in my notes if you want to write it down. Reconciliation, true reconciliation is motivated by love for your family. Now you might be here today, I get it. You might be here today and say, Brian, I don't feel those same emotions. <laughs> Joseph might have been moved for love or by love for his brothers, but love is not the word that I would use when I think of the family member with whom I am having difficulty. You might say today, as a matter of fact, Brian, the emotions I feel are anger, bitterness, or maybe even resentment. And let me remind you of a truth that Pastor Jose mentioned last week in his message, and it's true, not only about marriages, but it's true for all of our relationships. And the truth is this, love is not an emotion. Love is is a choice. When the Bible says that God loves us, it doesn't mean that he looks down at you and me and he, his heart gets all mushy and gushy and he wants to cry and he loves you. I'm sure he does feel emotion for us, but biblical love is a choice. That God has chosen to love us not because of who we are, but God has chosen to love us in spite of who we are. And so it is love, biblical love, that motivates us to reconcile. So I have no idea what your relationship is like today, what your situation is like, but I would challenge you with this thought. We must be like Joseph. We must respond like Joseph. Joseph was a peacemaker. He wasn't concerned about his brother's attitude towards him, but instead he took the initiative to forgive. Boy, that's so tough. If you catch anything today, catch that. Joseph took the initiative to forgive. Many of us in our situation sit back, and I've talked to many people with our arms crossed, and you know what? I'd be willing to forgive my brother if he forgave me. Or I'd be willing to reach out to this sibling if they reached out to me. I'm willing. I'm just waiting for them. We find here in the passage that it's Joseph who takes the initiative. Let me suggest to you, let me encourage you that you be the first one to pick up the phone and make a call. You be the first one to give a hug, even though it's awkward. I know the awkwardness of it. You be the first one to give a hug. You be the first one to write a note. You might sit back and say, Brian, my family member doesn't deserve it. Listen today, love doesn't give a person what they deserve. Love demonstrates grace. You see, true biblical love responds in a way that is counterintuitive. It goes against our human, sinful, fallen nature. It's countercultural. Because our culture tells you, man, if somebody does something wrong with you, man, wipe your hands of them and turn the other way. You don't owe them anything. That's what our culture teaches us. But true biblical love is countercultural. It is Christ-like. Here's a question I want you to ask yourself. Just ask yourself this question. What if Jesus treated us like we treat others? What if Jesus treated us like we treat 
that obnoxious, cantankerous family member? What if Jesus treated us like we treat that family member who offended us, that we just walked away from and said, I don't want anything to do with that? What if Jesus treated us that way? And by the way, he could treat us that way. Because that's what we deserve. We are the example of unfaithfulness towards him. Yet he and his love is always faithful to us in spite of our unfaithfulness. I'm reminded of the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. Paul says this, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Notice this phrase, As God in Christ forgave us. We forgive not because the person deserves it. We forgive because we are forgiven. Let that sink in today. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Say that with me today. I'm forgiven. Say it. I'm forgiven. Say it again like you mean it. I'm forgiven. God didn't forgive you because you deserved it. God didn't forgive you because you finally came to your senses. God didn't forgive you because you took the initiative. No, it was God who took the initiative towards us. The second thing I wrote under that point, if you have your outlines, is this reconciliation. Our reconciliation for others is motivated by the example of Jesus Christ. Our reconciliation is motivated by the example of Christ. How were we reconciled to God? I'd remind you of what Paul says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Paul says this, For God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. As a matter of fact, if we looked at the context, if you went back to verse 6, here's what Paul says. Paul says that Jesus didn't die for a perfect man. He didn't even die for someone who was good. But then verse 8, he says, but God showed his love for us. Here's what Paul is saying. When we weren't perfect, when we weren't good, when we didn't reach out to him, he reached out to us. God showed his love to us in that while we were sinners, Jesus died for us. Here's another great verse in 1 John 4, 19. John says this, we love him because he first loved us. Isn't it great? Aren't you glad that God loved you first? Aren't you glad today that God didn't sit up in heaven and say, okay, I'm going to wait till Brian does these five things, and when he does these five things, then I'm going to respond to him in love. I'm so grateful that he didn't respond to me that way. And so our reconciliation with others is not based upon whether that family member deserves it, whether we feel like we can rationally and realistically fix the situation. Our reconciliation, our response to them is motivated by none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus took the initiative in our sin. He reaches out to us in our sin. He reaches out to us in our brokenness. He reaches out to us in our rebellion. He shows us love, not because we deserve it, because we don't. Yet he loves us anyway. That, my friends, is how we should love others. We should have patience because God showed patience to us. We should love because we have been loved. We should forgive because we are forgiven. So as we look at the story of Joseph, we find Joseph taking the initiative. If anybody in Scripture other than Jesus had the right to lash out, to condemn, to reject, to never have anything to do with him again, it would have been Joseph. But Joseph responds with godliness. And he takes the initiative in restoring the relationship with his brothers. Let me show you a second truth that's equally as profound. And it's so clearly seen in Genesis chapter 45. In your outline, I say it this way. Recognize the sovereignty of God in the midst of broken relationships. Recognize the sovereignty of God. This is so hard, but I want you to see it. And I want us to to kind of take our time and walk through this. So notice verse 4. Notice what happens. So here's Joseph's brothers. The text says they're dismayed, they're terrified in his presence. So can you imagine what's going through their mind? Oh, and I know, 
we're dead. <laughs> I mean, we're dead ducks. We're never going to see our family again. I, I, I mean, he's going to give us what we deserve. But notice how Joseph responds. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. Can you imagine the apprehension? Does he have a sword in his hand? Does he have a knife in his hand? You know, what's going to happen? He says, come near to me, please. And they came near. And I'm sure he had to rehearse it again. He said, I am your brother Joseph. At this point, Joseph looked Egyptian. It's not like he looked like the Joseph they sold into slavery. He was speaking up to this point to them in Egyptian. They had no idea. And he says, come near. Look at me. I am your brother Joseph. Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not, me, do not be dismayed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Note this, if you underline in your Bibles, if you mark it, if you highlight it, note this. He said, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to keep alive for your many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. I read that and I say, wow, wow. Joseph said, it's not you who sent me here. It was God. Joseph could have said anything at that point. He could have looked at them as you and I might have been prone to do and said, sit down for a second. Let me tell you what's happened the last 13 years of my life. And you are responsible for it. He could have done that. He could have condemned them for their selfish actions. He had Jewish guards at his disposition. At any moment, all of them would have been killed. He could have done that could have looked at them and told them how undeserving they were of food and how undeserving they were of forgiveness but here's what he does catch this please catch this he lets them off the hook he does he lets them off the hook he doesn't look at them and cast blame and cast shade on them and make them feel guilty he lets them off the hook as a matter of fact he takes the shade off of them and he places the blame on whom on God he says this it was God who sent me here not you so here's what I wrote in my notes right after that what Question mark, question mark, question mark in my notes. It wasn't God who put Joseph in a pit, was it? It wasn't God who got the money and sold him into slavery. What in the world is Joseph talking about? Why is he letting them off the hook? Why is he not casting blame and aspersion and condemnation on them? He looks at them and said, you were cruel, you were mean. You were unkind, you were terrible, but it was God who sent me here. Please catch this, church, please catch this. It's in your notes, I'll say it a couple of ways, but catch this. God's sovereignty always overrules, supersedes man's cruelty. God's sovereignty always overrules supersedes, overcomes man's cruelty. Catch this, church. This is so, if you can grasp this principle, it will transform your life. Catch this. God's plans for your life are more powerful, more purposeful than the insults, the offenses, the rejections, and the heartbreaks that other people do to you. Did you catch that? Let me say it again. God's plans for your life, God's purposes for your life are more powerful than the insults, the offenses, the rejections, the heartbreaks that other people cause to you. In other words, nobody, nobody can thwart God's plans for your life. No family member, no brother or sister, no parent who abused you, no, 
No father who didn't love you. No spouse who didn't treat you correctly. Nothing, no one can thwart God's plans for your life. His sovereignty overrules everything. Joseph sits back. Joseph sits back and he realizes that the brothers meant only evil for him. They were cruel to him. But instead of casting the blame, throwing shade on them, he sits back and says, it wasn't you. It was God. It was God who brought me here. Here's what I want you to catch in your outline. It's this. (laughs) You need to recognize the sovereignty of God, or to recognize the sovereignty of God is to realize that God can use the bad for his good. God can use the bad for his good. In Genesis chapter 50, so here's what happens. So in Genesis chapter 50, Jacob, the patriarch, dies. And the brothers now are thinking, oh, Joseph was only kind to us because dad was alive. And now that dad's gone, we're in trouble. So they find themselves in Joseph's presence once again, once again pleading for their life. And here was Joseph's statement. This is so profound. If you memorize scripture, this is a great verse to memorize. Joseph looks at his brothers and he says this, Do not fear. Am I in the place of God? Let me pause there for a second and say this because in our relationships, here's what we often do. We often play God in our relationships. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? Somebody hurts me, someone offends me, and I sit back and think it's my job to make them feel the hurt that they caused to me. It's my job to make sure that they feel their repercussions for their actions. It's my job to make sure that they understand what they did. It's my job to make them feel sorry for their actions. Joseph said, I'm not God. I'm not God. It's not my responsibility to do that. And here's the statement he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Let that that sink into your mind and heart. You meant it for evil. You wanted to kill me. You never wanted to see me again. You threw me into a pit. You sold me as a piece of meat. You sold me into slavery. You went back and told our dad that I had been eaten by an animal. In your mind, you wanted me gone forever. You meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. Can you relate to that, church? You ever had somebody that did something so despicable to you, something that hurt you, they said something to you, they treated you in a way, they, they, they didn't show you respect, they blotted you out, they kicked you out of the family, you weren't treated as some of the other siblings were treated, you had a parent who had abused you, and they treated you terribly, tragically, no doubt about it, but in the midst of that, God was always in always let me say it this way it's in my notes this way and it's this joseph's grace filled theological response has gone down in history as a classic statement on the sovereignty of god and here's what i want you to catch the sovereignty of god when i understand the sovereignty of god it changes the question it changes the question completely it changes the question from What have you done to me, and what do you deserve? It changes that question. It changes the paradigm completely to what is God doing in my life? What is God trying to accomplish in my life? See, when we truly understand the sovereignty of God, we realize that God has this omnipotent ability 
to take the evil actions, the evil intentions of others, the unkindness, the cruelty, the lack of respect, uh, not, not understanding boundaries, not abiding by the things that we say. God has the divine omnipotent ability to take all of those bad things that people do to us and somehow mix it together and accomplish what he wants to accomplish in our lives. So, so, so I would submit to you today, and it's not a lack of compassion, please don't view it this way. I, it's not I'm not compassionate to what you are going through, but whatever you are going through today, how painful it is, however estranged you are with family members, however long it's been that you have not communicated with that family member, I would submit to you today that God is doing something in your life. God has not made a mistake. He's not up in heaven sitting back thinking, how in the world can I resolve this situation? God's in control. He's sovereign. And Joseph understood that. So here's an important point. If you have your outlines, I said it this way. To recognize the sovereignty of God keeps me from becoming embittered by terrible people and tragic events. When I understand the sovereignty of God, I'm able to take the gut punch that someone gives to me, and I'm able to take it realizing that God's purpose in my life is greater than their hurt. God's purpose in my life is greater than their insults. God's purpose, God's plans for me are greater than anything that I'm going through. And I'm able to rise above bitterness. And I'm able to rise above resentment. And I'm able to uh, rise above rejection. Because I serve a God who's at work in my life. And I trust God in the midst of everything. That's what Joseph did. You meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. I'll give you a third point, and then I want to get really practical today. The third point is this. Choose to forgive and forget the bad that was done to you. Choose to forgive, and yes, I said, forget the bad that was done to you. You've heard people say, maybe you've said it. I'll forgive you, but I will not forget what you did to me. I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget. We say that, by the way, for two reasons. And, and we make the commitment in our heart that we're never going to forget what that person did to us for two basic reasons. Catch these, because the reason we don't forgive and forget is one of these two reasons. It's either we want our offender, whoever it is, to live with the realization of their actions. <laughs> If I forget, if I let you off the hook, all of a sudden you're going to forget what you did to me. And I can't let you off the hook. So I might forgive you, but I will not forget. Because I don't want you ever to forget. So if I have to, I'm going to remind you of it over and over and over by the way, if I can pause, Jose talked about marriage last week. We do that in our marriages all the time. We do that in our arguments all the time. Because when we ever, whenever we deal with an issue, with an argument in our marriage, we have a tendency, and I'm chasing a rabbit here, but we have a tendency to not resolve it at that moment, kind of sweep it under the rug. And the next time we have an argument, guess what we do? We bring it up all over again. And we bring it up all over again. And so our arguments start out arguing about this, but we end up arguing about the things that we've done for the last 20 years. Why is that? We say we forgive, but we've never forgotten what our spouse has done to us. With all transparency, in 36 years, I've done some things to Vicki that have hurt her deeply. And she's done some things to me that have hurt me deeply. But we've made a commitment to each other that we are never going to bring those things up again. They're forgiven. And they're not only forgiven, they're forgotten. They're forgotten. I have to do that for my own sanity. And I have to do that for the relationship. So because we don't do that, we always live and respond with our guard up. 
We always live remembering what our offenders have done to us. Think with me though, church, is that the way that God forgives us? It's not. Two verses, Micah chapter 7 and verse 19. Micah says this, he will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast our sins, notice what it says, in the depths of the sea. What's the idea to never be reminded of them again? Hebrews chapter 6, or excuse me, chapter 8 and verse 12. God says this, for I will be merciful towards their iniquities, and I will, notice this, remember their sins no more. You might sit back and say, how's that possible? God's omniscient. He knows everything. God never forgets anything. It's not like, you know, your birthday comes around and God says, oh shoot, today's Brian's birthday. I forgot his birthday. God never forgets anything. He's omniscient. He knows anything. So how in the world can an omniscient God forget? And here's the idea. The idea is that God chooses to not remember. God chooses to never bring it up again. My sins are forgiven They're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm so grateful that when I go to God as I do every day and I ask God for forgiveness for the sins that I've committed, you know, God, please forgive me of, you know, a rebellious attitude or God, please forgive me of not telling the truth. I'm so glad that God doesn't look at me like, you asked me that yesterday and you asked me that the day before and you asked me that the day before. When are you going to learn? God never responds that way, but he always forgives me every time as if it was the first time that I committed that sin. Why is that? Because my sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, and he forgives me, and he forgets to never remember, and what that means is I will never, ever, ever be accused of those sins again. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And one day I will stand before Jesus Christ, and I will stand before him not as the worthless sinner that I am, but I will stand before Jesus Christ as a perfect representation of the Son of God, not because of who I am, but because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for me. When he sees me, he sees Jesus. So how do we forgive? We forgive in the exact same way. To forget is a choice to not bring up the offense ever again. Be like Jesus. Forgive the offenses of your loved ones. Forget their mistakes. Make a decision, a choice to put it in the past and leave it there. I would say this practically though, forgiveness is something that is done in your heart. Forgiveness, quite actually, is more between you and God than it is between you and the other person. It really is. Forgiveness is more about something that's between you and God than it is between you and the other person. That's so important for us to see. Reconciliation, though, is different. Forgiveness is one-sided, while reconciliation requires both parties catch that. That's a, that's a whole different topic for another day that I wish that we had time to get into, but we see that from, from this story. If we'd had the time to read from chapter 41 to 45, we would see that this was not Joseph's first encounter with his brothers. It was the second encounter, and in the first encounter, he actually throws out a test with his brothers, because here's what he's trying to see. He's trying to see, it, are his brothers really repentant of their actions? Are they willing to restore that relationship? You say, Brian, how did he do it? Read Genesis 41 through 45, and you can flesh out the entire story. It's in order to truly reconcile both parties. Both parties must repent of their actions and come together. You cannot make somebody else do do that. You can only do your part. That's why Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 12 and verse 18. He says, if possible, so far as depends with you, live peaceably with all. Live peaceably with all men. What does that mean? 
It means that we can do everything in our power to restore, reconcile, and heal a relationship. But if the other party is not willing, then there's nothing we can do. Yet Paul says this, as followers of Jesus Christ, we should do everything in our power to reconcile and to restore. Let me give you four practical tips as we come to a close today. So, so, so practically, how do we begin to make this happen? So, so today, or the next time that I meet this family member, how do I begin to make this happen? How do I make sure that our relationships don't get to this point? Let me give you four simple tips, tips yet four truly profound and difficult things to do. The first is this, be humble. Be humble. Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 2, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. So see, here's what I believe with all of my heart. Humility on your part will often restore the conflict before it breaks the relationship. The relationship is often broken because we exert pride. <laughs> Listen, I'm not going to be treated that way. I'm not going to let you talk to me that way. You can't respond to me that way. I deserve better than that. We allow our pride, whether justified or unjustified, we allow our pride to stand up and it, it causes a rift in the relationship. Once again, our relationship with God is restored, not because of our humility. Read Philippians chapter 2. It's because of the humility of Jesus Christ. And he humbled himself. And as a result of his humility, you and I are restored to God. Be humble. You say, Brian, what does that mean? Take the offense. Control your tongue. Don't respond. Take the gut punch. Realize that the relationship, the long-term relationship, is more important than the actions of that one moment. And if you and I will respond with humility in that moment, or maybe even after an extended period of time, I believe with all of my heart that we can begin to see restoration and reconciliation occur. Be humble. Be the one to take the initiative. Be the one to ask for forgiveness. Be the one to make the phone call. Be the one to give the hug. Be the one to walk across the room and have a conversation with them. Demonstrate humility. Here's a second tip. Be controlled. Be controlled. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? Well, first and foremost, control your tongue. <laughs> control what you say. You might sit back and say, well, that's hard to do because I've got to let that person know what I think. I've got to tell them, and, and, and that's just who I am. My personality is I say what I think. When I mention being controlled, I'm not talking about you controlling yourself. I'm talking about you being controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. One of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. And you might not be able to control your tongue. Listen, I struggle with that. I speak all the time before I think. My mom used to tell me, and I did it yesterday. You can ask Vicki. I did a perfect example of it yesterday. I'll let her tell you the story of it yesterday. But my mom used to tell me all the time, Brian, your mouth is in motion before your brain is in gear. That's what my mom used to tell me all the time. I, I, I talk before I listen. I talk before I think. If I feel something, I feel like I have to tell you what I think. And here's what I'm learning. I'm learning that I don't have to always say what I think. And even though I can't control my tongue, the Holy Spirit of God can control my tongue. And so I frequently pray, God, please shut me up. <laughs> this last week, we had a, a bunch of our family. We don't get together with our family much, and you guys know Justin and Jenny and the girls were in, and so my mom and dad are up in Sebring. They came down, and my brother and his wife, they came down, and so we had a house full, and God knows, Monday morning, before they came, 
I spent time with the Lord saying, God, please, Holy Spirit of God, control my tongue. I don't want to say anything inappropriate. I want my words to be guided by the Holy Spirit of God. And even though I might want to say something, and maybe I need to say something, I want those words to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. That's a great prayer before you meet together with family members. Holy Spirit of God, control me. Here's a third point. Be understanding. Be understanding. You see, your relatives are sinners just like you. They're sinners. They have good days. They have bad days. God is at work in their lives just as God is at work in your life. You need to understand that. I love how Paul says it in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3. He says this, be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He says, listen, there ought to be an eagerness on your part to maintain unity. Why? Because God is working on them. And I would even submit to you, I'm, I'm speaking to the most part to a, a group of mature believers. And so if you are a mature believer, that means that many of your family members are not as mature as you. You respond like a mature believer. You be the one to demonstrate grace. You be the one to demonstrate patience. You be the one to demonstrate humility. You be the one to take the initiative. You be the one to take the first step. Be understanding. Because God is at work in their lives. And the last one is all-encompassing. Be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. When I was a little kid, we sang this chorus, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, my desire to be like him. I can think of no better prayer in your life and mine as we fight for our families than to say, God, help me to be like Jesus. I'm going to be patient like him, loving like him, caring like him, forgiving like him. No matter whether my family member deserves it or not, help me to be like Jesus. I would submit to you this part, and we're done. So the praise team, I'm sure they're in back. They're waiting on me to kind of close. So Jonas, come on out with the praise team. So I would, I would submit to you with this thought that your family is your mission field. It really is. Your family is your mission field. I would also submit that it's more difficult to be Christ-like in a family setting than it is to be Christ-like in your work setting. Because sometimes our pride just seems to raise up with us. And, and, and we tend to not have the patience and being loving and be as caring and all of those with family members as we are with other people. But be reminded that God has divinely and sovereignly placed you in your family not just for the purpose of your family being a blessing to you, but for you, for the purpose of you being a blessing to them and for the purpose of you pointing them to Jesus. Joseph's a great example for us. He took the initiative. He recognized the sovereignty of God. and He forgave 11 brothers who didn't deserve forgiveness, but he forgave them and allowed his relationship with them to be restored. May God help us to respond in the same way. Would you stand with me today with your head bowed and your eyes closed? And so before we sing, just a, just a simple thought. If you're here today and you don't know whether you're a believer or not and you sit back and you'd say, man, Brian, I actually feel estranged from God today. Be reminded of the fact that Jesus came for the purpose of reconciling you and I to God. And where you are, man, just by reaching out and repenting of your sins and, and reaching out to him, he's there with his arms wide open. And he's ready to bring you into the family and completely restore your relationship and to reconcile you and to give you all the benefits of a family member. If you'll just come to Jesus. 
We'll have some of our leaders down front. If we can pray with you, we'd love to have the opportunity to pray with you. Maybe just want to come and, and pray. Maybe pray for your family. Maybe pray for a relationship. Maybe pray with a family member. I don't know. Be sensitive this morning to the Holy Spirit of God. Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Help us to take it. Help us to apply it to our lives. May our marriages, may our kids, Lord, our relationship with our kids, our relationship with our parents, our relationship with our siblings, may all of our relationships reflect Jesus Christ and give glory to God. And help us to love others just like you love us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.